I get in, shut the door. Dude immediately makes a wrong turn out of the parking lot, and I am on his ass. I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> no, we know where we're going. We know where we're going. And he starts stuttering. He gets nervous. He's like, I, I, uh, man, don't worry. Uh, I, I know a shortcut. Don't worry. I'm going to get you there in a jiffy. And I said, jiffy? Nobody says Jiffy anymore. <laughs> this son of a bitch is going to kill us. <laughs> Listen, that's right where my mind goes. All right, you can judge me all you want to, but I live my life like every gun is loaded. Okay? Every snake is a king cobra. And no matter what touches me in the ocean, it's jaws. Okay? <laughs> I know I've had seaweed hit me in the leg, and I'm like, ah! You, try to, you ever try to walk something off in the ocean? You can't look cool doing that. You can't. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to The Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it. In the Night Pan Studios, I am Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all your social media. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for your support. This channel has grown. The community has grown. The special continues to do well. Please go watch and support my special lefty son on my YouTube channel. And uh, while you're there, subscribe to that channel. All right. And if you got to have more, then you got to check out the Patreon. It's called The Honeydew with Y'all. And it's The Honeydew with y'all, and like I say every week, the wildest motherfucking stories on the internet. I don't care what else you got out there. It's five bucks a month. You're getting the Honeydew ad free. You're getting it a day early. You're getting it audio and video, all right, at no additional cost. It's five bucks, and you still have hundreds of episodes to go and listen to. So go check it out. It's definitely worth your time. Uh, and if you're looking for a new podcast, Go check out an old favorite called The Crab Feast. It's an audio-only one. Subscribe. It's a great storytelling podcast I used to do with Jay Larson. And uh, the tour is starting, guys. I'm starting to feel better enough to get out there. They tell me my, my D-dimer levels look like they're in the right zones to travel. So May 26th and 27th, the live and the live tour kicks off in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, June 23rd and 24th, I'll be in Tacoma, Washington, July 7th and 8th. Appleton, Wisconsin. We did have to reschedule Tulsa, Oklahoma, July 21st and 22nd because the club's not going to be ready yet. Not because your boy. Your boy's kind of ready. I was going to say I stay ready, but I'm kind of ready. All right. Now, y'all know what we do over here. By the way, dates are continuing to be added. All tickets available at ryansickler.com. That's the biz. You know what we're doing over here. We're highlighting the lowlights. I always say these are the stories behind the storytellers. Very excited to have this guest on here today. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Dave Stone. Welcome to the Honeydew, Dave. Thank you, buddy. Thank Thanks, you, man. brother. Thanks for having me. You're welcome, man. Thank you for being here. And uh, before we get into your story today, why don't you plug and promote everything Dave Stone? Sure. Uh, got a new special out now on YouTube uh, called Pack a Lunch. Uh, so you can go watch that right now. Also, you can get the uh, audio version on vinyl at blondemedicine.com. That's who I'm, I, my yeah. album's with. Yeah, great folks. Dominic Del Bene, great shout folks out, at Blonde Medicine. Shout out shout to Dominic out. and uh, Jessica. Yeah. Uh, great folks over there. So yeah, uh, limited edition vinyl. It's a big fat two LP. I'm a vinyl guy, so I, I like the colored vinyl. Mm -hmm. So we got like a nice colored variant. Uh, two LP. Uh, limited edition. They're moving quick. So get over there at blondemedicine.com. And grab those. And then uh, two podcasts. I do The Boogie Monster with Kyle Kinane, mm -hmm. uh, up and coming young lad. I, I think he's going to do all right. Great episode yeah, here yeah. on Honeydew. Check out Kyle Kinane's <laughs> Kyle's episode. so funny. Uh, yeah, Boogie Monster. And then I do another podcast called The Stonebergs with my wife, where uh, a, a really um, disheveled married couple tries to give advice to people. In all right. So, yeah, two idiots that can barely handle our own business are trying to uh, lend our advice to, to the masses. So. That's where you can find me. All right. Well, I know you have, we have a specific story to talk about today, <laughs> but let's lead up into that. So sure. you're originally from Georgia, correct? Yeah. Yep, Georgia. All right. You grow up there. Mm -hmm. And um, well, how do you get into, what do you get into work-wise as soon as you're out of school? Are you going to college first? What is, what is Dave Stone doing? Yeah, I went to college, uh, walked on at West Georgia University football. Did you? Yeah. What position? Uh, linebacker, the old linebacker slash kicker combo. 
that old combo. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah, that Lawrence Taylor guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, like, the LTI. Hey, this guy's a good kicker. Maybe we can put him at uh, weak linebacker. Uh, just did that for a couple of months till I hurt my knee, and then uh, knew that I was going to miss like the whole season. Walked so. on and walked off. Huh? Yep, walked uh, on and uh, walked limped off. off. Yeah, limped off. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then just went to uh, like a community college for like another couple of semesters. Just no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, dropped out of that and went to broadcasting school. So my first like career job, I was a radio DJ in Atlanta uh, for about four years. What radio station? Uh, a bunch of them. But the big one, it was the one that I grew up listening to. So oh, that wow. was pretty okay. cool yeah. in Atlanta. 99X, WNNX. It was like the K-Rock of Atlanta, mm -hmm. you know, modern rock or alt rock, whatever you want to call it. But uh, yeah, so I was doing that and, uh, and at the same time bouncing around at other radio stations. Like uh, it was such a nomadic profession. I literally moved eight times in four years. And then my final radio job, uh, I got let go because it was right when it was right around the turn of the century. That sounds weird to say. Mm -hmm. But when everything was becoming automated and there was a lot of uh, consolidation and just like half our station got laid off. And uh, that's what led to my other career that we'll talk about later. But uh, yeah, radio, um, did some odds and ends. Uh, this is, some people find this interesting. I was actually a tour manager for a couple of metal bands. Were you really? Uh, yeah. Uh, Chris Jericho's band, Fozzy. They're still around. Are they? They're okay, still yeah. out there doing it, playing good size venues. But yeah, I was Fozzy and Stuck Mojo's tour manager for okay. a couple of years. Stuck Mojo's one of these old like uh, rap metal pioneers, early 90s. So yeah, it was the same like core Anthrax and yeah, shit. A, a, about the same time. time, yeah. So it was the same core group of dudes. They had Stuck Mojo, uh, the same core, and then Fozzy was basically the same band, but add Jericho on vocals. So okay, that was cool. And I, you know, I grew up a wrestling guy. I kind of I'm not a wrestling guy anymore. I mean, I, I appreciate that forty year old men are obsessed with it, mm -hmm. but uh, I uh, I grew out of it. But it was still cool, like you know, working with Jericho, and that was like kind of the peak of his fame. So uh, we got to go do some of those wrestling shows. Monday Night Raw went up yeah. there, and the band performed live, and uh, got to meet Stone Cold and The Rock before he was just a mega star. But uh, yeah, so a little bit of everything. So then you're bouncing around doing this and that. Then mm -hmm. how do you get into your career? And it's law. Is it law enforcement? Yeah, yeah. I was. I was just a cop. I was just a uniform beat cop. What made you decide to do that? Uh, I just needed a job. Like when radio ended, I was just kind of bouncing around doing part time jobs. And during that time, I got engaged way too young. And I'm 23. I'm engaged. I, I, I'm done with my radio career. Uh, you know, I got no education to fall back on. I was like, ah, I just needed health insurance and a, and a 401k. And uh, a buddy of mine had already worked for this police department. He's like, hey, we're hiring next year, man. You need to apply. And I was like, I don't know if I want to be a cop. And uh, one thing led to another. How old are you at that point? Uh, I started when I was 23. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. And were you always a guy that you could pass a piss test and all that stuff? Or did you also have to go clean and sober to become a cop? No, back then I was straight edge. Like I wasn't okay. like straight edge, but I just, I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. So weed. that wasn't a problem. That wasn't issue. an issue. Okay. You know, so. so what is the, what is it like? What is, are you an, are you in Atlanta like PD or what is, what are you a Georgia trooper? Yeah. Like what the hell are you? I was Cobb County police and Cobb, Cobb County, County. Yeah. is, uh, most of Atlanta is in Fulton County, mm -hmm. but the County just North of there, which I think technically some of Atlanta seeps into was Cobb County. So County police, uh, big department. I think we had like close to a thousand officers. Um, you know, just North Metro Atlanta was our whole area. So yeah, just uh, went to the academy. That was about uh, eight or nine months, and then uh, wait, it's that long? Yeah, yeah. It was. It was quite. A, That's longer than boot camp, then, isn't oh, yeah, it? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Boot camp. Boot camp's what a couple weeks. months. Yeah, yeah, something like that. But yeah, this was I think eight months. And uh, what are you learning? Just it was classroom setting Monday through Friday. Uh, just, I, I don't, I'm tempted to do my, my jokes, but, uh, just, they teach you the basics of law enforcement. Like a lot of, half of it was like, like law school kind of, mm -hmm. you know, they teach you the, the, the textbook stuff. And then the other half was more, you know, hands-on tactical stuff. Now, how are you learning situations like we're seeing on fucking everybody's cell phone mm -hmm. from a classroom? <sighs> like l learning mistakes from real officers or just i mean how do you teach 
how do you teach a cop that's mm-hmm. under duress mm-hmm. that same feeling and shit in a classroom? You can't. Well, they show you a lot of videos. Oh, you do every see Every video of every cop who ever got his ass kicked, we're going to show you this video. I have what seen the one wrong. where the guy got killed and they were saying what he did wrong. Yeah. yeah and you can hear him screaming and shit. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. terrifying. And they, yeah. They, they really hammer that into your head. And uh, Like they're showing you f- brothers and sisters that are dying because of mistakes they made. Yeah. That's yeah. part of the training. Yeah. And uh, the term for it, they call officer safety. Like they just hammered officer safety and like, you know, I have, as we'll learn, I have mixed emotions about my time there. But uh, I will say it was a good department in terms of like training. You know, it wasn't, you know, Mayberry. Sure. You know, some small. It was a big department, well funded, a lot of resources, uh, a lot of good training. So they they really hammer officer safety. Uh, so you get out of uh, training, mm-hmm. and what do you become then? What is your first job? First job is just uh, what the, just. Uniform patrol, basically. Uh, and is that our, in a car? Or yeah. Do they still have on foot patrol anymore? I don't think so. Maybe some cities that have, you know, a, a real pedestrian heavy, you know, city center might. But I don't think we had any uh, on foot cops. We had bicycle cops and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But uh, basically, everybody starts out in uh, what we call uniform patrol. And our whole uh, department or territory was divided up into five different precincts. And then within each precinct, you have beats. But so they send you to one of the five precincts and uh, for another eight months, you ride with an FTO, a field training officer. So it's like eight or nine months of schooling. Then you get out and then you just ride shotgun every night for about another eight months. So my fucking cousin, Mm -hmm. this motherfucker lucked out. I mean, did he or didn't he? I think he did. But. Same thing. He gets out of, uh, is it, what is it called? We call uh, it mandate school. Mandate yeah. school. And now he's riding with a, a partner mm-hmm. or whatever. And it is week one. Mm-hmm. It might be day two. Mm-hmm. And they all of a sudden, they're in a high-speed chase. Yeah. And they're chasing this car. And some asshole cuts out in front of them. So the his partner tries to go around them. Mm-hmm. And in doing so, he hits the median and the car flips. Mm. And they're rolling, and they're both okay. Car's upside down. My cousin's ankle's fucked. And he's climbing out, and he said, Ryan, I was so fucked up and concussed and disoriented that he just said, they teach you also to cover your weapon. Mm -hmm. And that's all that kept going through his head was protect my fucking weapon so someone doesn't get it and use it against me. Yep. And he said he couldn't help it, but all he kept, he said no one was asking him anything. And he just kept yelling, I am the police. I am the police. And he said no one was asking him. If he okay. Was. They were like, we know we you are. with the you uniform in the and car the, with the lights. And I am shit. the police. He said uh, it's all he could yell. I wish I'd have used that one. He said, I am the police. Oh, I was laughing so hard. So they put rods and shit. Ugh. In his fucking uh, ankle, and he gets married, and he's doing his little vows, and he cries, you know, mm-hmm. and he's Mister Italian American, hard ass, doesn't cry, but he cries, and I'm fucking with him a little bit. I'm like, oh, you over there crying and uh-huh. shit, you motherfucker. We get to the reception, and there's this fucking step down that it is hard as shit to see. Uh huh. Uh oh. And he hits this motherfucking step down, and that ankle pops, and he goes down the crowd, and he's holding it. He just looks up at me, and a tear comes down his face, and I just had, I couldn't help it. I had to kick him eyes down. I was like, hey, Timmy cried twice at his wedding, everybody. Look at this motherfucker. It's he's okay. He is like, the police. Ah. Yeah. I should have yelled. Yeah, that. I thought he was going to yell that. <laughs> I am the police. He cried okay. twice, this motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. So he then. Gets like they give him an office job, mm-hmm. and now he's a liability on the streets because of what happened. Yeah, they fucking retire him after only a few years. Really, in his th- early thirties, and he gets a full, full pension, pension and everything the rest of his life. Thanks, and man. they do programs where, like, if you li- move into a neighborhood, uh-huh. they'll give you a discount on the house because they want you to have yeah. you know a little presence in the neighborhood. Absolutely. You know, especially if you're a trooper that takes a car home. Yeah. Take that, home car. that fucking cruiser sitting in the driveway is like, let's not go fuck with that guy's yeah. house. You know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had a couple of those gigs where I got free rent at an apartment complex you did? Yeah. In, in exchange for being the um, 
what did they call it? Courtesy officer. Mm -hmm. I was the courtesy officer. I'd handle noise complaints and stuff like that. Or if I was actually working in something, they'd call me and I'd just send somebody else over there. But yeah. Yeah. You just, I think we call those part times. There's all kind of little part times gotcha. that you can do to supplement your income. Okay. So, yeah. But that was a, that was a sweet gig. Just working at a, just living free rent in a nice apartment complex. Yeah. And I'd, once a month I'd have to hand out notices or, you know, the occasional noise complaint. But yeah, it was pretty easy. Pretty good gig. So well, then do you grow up through, uh, come up through the ranks a bit or what? Uh, not really. I wasn't there long enough <laughs> to really climb the ranks. I was there uh, about four <laughs> years, four and a half years. Okay. Um, so yeah. And, uh, hated every second of it. Did you? Yeah. You know, at first, cause like I said, it wasn't anything, I didn't grow up wanting to be a cop. You sure. Know, I, you know, it's not it, in your family. Yeah. yeah it wasn't yeah, in my yeah, family, yeah. but you know, I still had obviously an interest in it in mm -hmm. terms of like, well, if I got to have a job, you know, at least I'm not sitting behind a desk and you got to remember too, the climate wasn't what it is now. This was, uh, 22 years ago. Yeah, this is when everybody was getting away with yeah. what's going on yeah. now. <laughs> 2001. It was still happening. Yeah. Everybody just getting away with yeah, it. Yeah, pre everybody having a <laughs> cell, phone. cell phone. Yeah, camera, yeah. But also, just the general climate wasn't yeah. as no, it wasn't. Um, yeah. you know paranoid as, as it is now. Just because there's not that that stuff didn't go on back then, but it just wasn't on the news every night like it is now. So, um, but he, yeah, my point is. You know, I thought, okay, well, I need a job. I need like a real job, something where mm -hmm. I can get some health benefits and stuff. So like it, for a guy who doesn't have a college degree, you know, this might be about the best I can do at this point in time it's in government my life. position. 23 years yeah. old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I, you know, I went into it with a good attitude, but then it just, it just sucks the life out of you quick. Cause you just, it, I'm in a weird position now where I see both sides of it. You know, I'm, I'm definitely not pro police, but I'm, you know, I see both sides and, and I'm quick to when I see a cop doing something wrong in the news, I'm like, yeah, fuck that guy. He should have known better. But also when some homeowners association president is screaming because a cop did something wrong, I'm like, well, you don't know exactly what their job entails. So mm -hmm. pump the brakes a little bit. But uh, you just every night you see. What's the, the craziest shit the, you, the, you saw in your four years? Third day out on the street. This I won't do the bit, but I had this in my. It's, I close in my new special about it. third night out of the academy, out on the street with an FTO. We find a. I found a de decapitated head. Come on, dude. Just yep, yeah, guy. Uh, what do you mean you found it, guy? Uh, Nineteen-year-old Georgia Tech student committed suicide by laying his head across some train tracks. And you guys are just out there cruising around, and you look over and see a head, or you got a call? We get a call that there's a mannequin on some train tracks. Oh no! And we both were like, I think I literally even said, like, that's an odd reason to call the police. And we get there, and uh, not a mannequin, just a <laughs> real human body Holy with fuck. no head. And I found the where head. was the head? How far away? About. Ten yards in a yards ditch. Yards in a yeah. ditch. Yeah. It cut it off and rolled. His head rolled. Yeah. I wonder, don't you wonder, don't you wonder if for like 10 seconds the brain is working enough where his head's bouncing and he's seeing that shit go around. I mean, and then the camera it's just got to be off. a little bit. A There's no way right? it's instant. There's no way it's instant if you're, I don't know. The I don't inside know, joke, I don't know a lot of anything. The inside joke was how many trains came by before he actually went through with it. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. and another fun fact, zero blood. They it just cauterized it, it, it cauterized the wound. Did it? Yeah, because all the heat from the what, what, they're not wheels, but yeah. what, are the, what are the things that train? You know, the little circular metal. I guess I they're mean, I would call metal them wheels. wheels. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, yeah. Fuck. And uh, I, again, not going to do the whole bit, but in my bit, and it's all true. Eventually, my FTO hands me a trash bag. No, and says, "Quote, go get him, Stone." No, and I was like, "Do what?" And then I was, I mean, he got shitty about it. He's like, take this fucking bag, go get his head. I was like, oh, okay. Day three. Day three. You picked up a human head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Day three. Good times. <laughs> on the job. Listen, there's cops out there that have been on the force 30 years and they can't yeah. tell you they've done that. Day two, <laughs> the night before that. Day two. We're day going two, backwards. I stepped in a bucket of human shit. Yeah, that well, that's a, that happens to us outside yeah. here at the studios. <laughs> Walking so. through a, a crack house and five-gallon Home Depot paint bucket. No. And, uh, yeah. Five-gallon. How do you step in a five-gallon bucket? It was dark. We were just kind of feeling around. Do you high step in? And yeah, you just, just yeah, no. for that reason, because I knew I was going to step on something and just right. No. It's like, oh, that was squishy. Oh, that's feces. Day two. 
I love being a cop. And day three is a head sever. Yeah. It's uh yeah, you just you see the worst Any of humanity. Fights? Oh yeah. A lot of fights. Tell me about some fights. Uh I fought a guy who was trying to take my gun. I fought a dude. This, I'm not laughing. Yeah. I'm laughing. You're like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. A lot of Yeah. I mean, seriously, in four years, probably 12 or 15, that, like that's, shit kickers. That's fucking, that's every three months. Yeah. Yeah, just a shit kicker. <laughs> it's quarterly. Yeah. Because that's what people don't understand. Like, <sighs> if you and I had an encounter with the police, like, it would be a big deal in mm -hmm. our week or our month or yeah. in our year. But yeah. I'm fighting people that, I'm probably the third <laughs> cop they fought this month. Yeah, like, right, it's just, yeah. Somebody, it's just like, this is what I do. I'm not afraid to fight a fucking cop. Send me to jail. Yeah. At least I don't have to pay rent. Yeah, like, that yeah. was the mentality of some of these people. Like, they mm -hmm. just, there's nothing scarier than someone who has nothing to lose. Amen. And you're just dealing with people who have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. You know, like, what the fuck do I care? Right. You know? And it was such an eye. Tell me about some of the fights. You said a guy was trying to get your gun. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is... <laughs> The whole story that we're leading up to was yeah. just, it was a series of events that just left me so disgruntled. You know, it was just just a disgruntled officer. Uh, I got in a fight one time with a dude, literally trying to steal my gun, uh, not to pawn it, not to steal it and run into the woods. He's trying to take my gun so he could use it on me. Uh, we're, you know, he's fucking got his hands all over my And shit. why? What, is, what do you fight? What did you catch up with him for? He had a warrant. He's going to okay. jail. It's when people know they're going they're to jail. They're like, fuck that. No, I'm not. And they're not. These guys know they're not going to jail for this charge. They're going to jail because they got a warrant from an old charge that is now going to give them five years, 10 years in prison, whatever it may be. And when you're dealing with people that are like, oh, if this cop puts both handcuffs on me, I'm going to jail for 10 years or whatever the case may be. And it was one of those situations where my... It was with I was with another officer. One little technique, and they always get this wrong in the movies. If if you're a perp and I'm a cop and I know I run your license, there's a warrant pops up, I don't tell you that you're under arrest until I have handcuffs on you. If I go, hey, turn around, you're you're under arrest. See you. You're like, well, I could run or I could fight yeah. or whatever. You always there's a technique to trick them. Like, hey man, before we go any further, uh, let me, you mind if I pat you down just to make sure you don't have any bombs or bazookas on you? And usually they'll comply to that, and you get them to turn around. Like, just put your hands behind your back and you pat them down. Click, click. You want to put those cuffs on them when they don't realize it's coming. That's legal. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So even if they're not under arrest, even if you just need to detain them for mm -hmm. your own safety. But yeah, you you act like you're just patting them down. Hey, turn around real quick. Boom, boom, click, click. But if I go, hey, man, you got a warrant. You're going to jail. You're like, no, I'm not. So anyway, in that scenario, my partner is the one that told him he was going to jail. before Tr we had, You Mr. Trigger Happy over yeah, here? Before, no, it's another one. <laughs> oh, okay. But before we had handcuffs on it and this guy just starts swinging and it was literally two on big dude? big dude two on one and he was you know we weren't winning and he was trying to, <laughs> he was trying to grab my uh, gun we we weren't winning and I, point is i got one handcuff on him and we're still fighting and uh i i to this day i don't remember if it was my partner or me cuz it was just such a melee but uh he got his wrist broke he had one handcuff on and his other wrist got broke mm. and i got in trouble for excessive use of force while uh, a suspect is in custody because he had one handcuff on. And when you deal with stuff like this, uh, I don't know how other departments do it, but we had like a civilian review board. And what that means is you have people from the, you know, an employee from the water department, an employee from the solicitor's office, an employee from the fire. It's a, it's a civilian. They're, they're not technically civilians because they work for the county. I see. But it's a civilian review board. And you, I have to go and explain what happened to people who have never been, been in, in law that, enforcement. Or in that scenario. Yeah, right this there. guy works for the water department right, and he's yeah. judging how I did my job. Right, yeah. And I got suspended for excessive use of force because I we broke a guy's wrist who was in handcuffs. And who I was kept, also trying to get your gun to kill you. Exactly. And I kept saying handcuff, singular. Yeah. Singular. We had one on him. And he was trying to get my gun. And so it was a series of things like that that just led me to being like, fuck this job, fuck this department. And, uh, you know, we can get into that later. But yeah, that no, that's up, what I want to talk that about. Led up that to led my, to my, what? Take us there. My poor decision making. Have you ever been just too damn high? We've all been there. With today's weed, finding your perfect dose can be a dangerous game. Dadgrass is reviving the pleasure of the casual toke so you can chill out without 
the stress. Daggrass is legal, organic, smokable hemp that relaxes your body and mellows your mind. Their 100% organic pre-rolled joints and flour are very low in THC and high in CBD, so you can enjoy the effects of CBD while keeping a clear head. Not looking to toke, Daggrass also offers the finest tinctures and gummies on the market, all the mellow goodness, no smoke required. All Daggrass products are federally legal for ages 18 and over, and it ships right to your door anywhere in the U.S. Whether you're looking for a new buzz or a chill way to enjoy an old favorite, Daggrass will leave you in a euphoric mood. Right now, Daggrass is offering my listeners 20% off your first order when you go to dadgrass.com slash honeydew. Go to dadgrass.com slash honeydew for 20% off your first order. That's dadgrass.com slash honeydew. Now, let's get back to the do. What was poor <laughs> What was poor decision making? Well, like I said, this was just, this was a series of things like that. I got suspended another time for wrecking a car in a chase. And it's like, I was, I'm chasing a guy. I wasn't on my way to work in a police car and just drag racing, you know, like mm -hmm. just getting, and not that like, of course there has to be checks and balances, but the whole problem, at least back then, they, like I said, in the academy, every day we watched a video of a cop getting killed, you know, officer safety, officer safety, officer safety, but also you got to do every single fucking thing exactly right, or we're going to suspend you or fire you or sue you or whatever. So, you know, you ask these officers to go out and do something, you know, dangerous, but, the, and I'm not defending corruption. Like, of course you get, but like, you're going to suspend me because I broke a dude's wrist who was only in one handcuff, a guy who was literally trying to kill me. Like I said, he didn't, he didn't want my gun because he's a collector. Right. He wasn't going to go run and pawn it. Clean he's, it. He's going to fucking kill me. Yeah. But yet I get suspended a week without pay. Because this guy got his wrist broke and he had one handcuff on. So it's just that sh mentality. Or like my department was very stat driven. It was like, how, how, you know, stats meaning how many tickets you write tonight, mm -hmm. Stone? How many arrests did you make? It's like, oh, I didn't make any because I handled 14 911 calls. You know, I'm going to like dangerous 911 calls and my beat partner's writing speeding tickets. So I, I would go to dangerous calls with no backup. Because Why no backup? Because my we called it beat partners. Like I said, the precinct it was – well, the department was divided up into five precincts. I worked at zone three. And then within that precinct, we had like 13 beats. Mm -hmm. And it just means little territories. You know, Dave handled – 3111 handles this beat. 3112 handles that beat. And like uh, you, we didn't have partners in the car, but we had beat partners, meaning if I'm 3112 and you're 3111, well, if, if 3112 gets a call – then as soon as I, you know, ten four in route, then my beat partner goes in code, will just say, show me in route to back him up. Any, almost any call, we, you'd have to go back somebody up because we don't know what it is. Right. You know. I would but, hope. And, and it's, we're, we're responsible for each other. Now, if someone, if, if my beat partner's writing a ticket and someone else is available, then they might be like, they'll give this guy a chance to hop in and go, I'm going to. But code seven was the phrase. But if no one is going to back me up, then someone else can hop on and go, hey, I'll go back him up. But if they're all busy and my beat partner's writing a fucking speeding ticket and I'm going to an armed robbery by myself. So, and then, and then you get back to the precinct. They're like, why didn't you write any speeding tickets? I was like, and we had this thing called a daily. It was just your, you log everything. I'm like, look at my fucking daily. When was I supposed to write a speeding ticket? So it was a lot of that, like, Where's your stats? Mm -hmm. You know, on paper, it looks like Officer Stone didn't do shit tonight because he had no tickets and no arrest. But I went to 13 different fucking calls. You know, like I have paperwork. I have reports on all these calls. But anyway, I'm elaborating on that. But it was just that mentality of like, do this, but also do this. And don't do that, but also do this. And why aren't you doing that? And make sure you do it yeah. by the book. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was a series of just disgruntled events. And uh, you want me to just get to the good part? One day, <laughs> you know, this is, you know, I, I've told this story on the Boogie Monster and, uh, but yeah, I, and I was telling you off the air, like, uh, I've been doing comedy 16 years. I've just now started talking about cop stuff. Just, I kept it a secret for all these years just because, A, the story I'm about to tell, <laughs> but also just even if there was no negative stories, it's still like, oh, you're a cop, fuck this guy. And like, as you know, half of stand up is winning over the audience or becoming likable. Long story short, been a cop four and a half years. 
probably been suspended three or four times without pay for things that I thought were unjust. I'm wrecking a car. I, re- I got suspended for wrecking a car because I was chasing a guy. The guy wouldn't pull over. But I wrecked... It's just shit like that. It's like, what? And then, you know, the people handing out the sentences are people that work at the water department. It's like, lady, do you have any fucking idea what I do? So anyway, I think I've made that point clear. I was very disgruntled. This is not a reflection of my character. But uh, one day, pulled over this dude. He was a Latino guy. Like one of the cheapest tickets we had. He was like a, a tag light. The little That was the easiest probable cause. The little light that illuminates your license plate. Yep. Most everybody's have gone out. Yep. And there's no way for you to know that unless like so your buddy. Pulls you over. Yeah, or your buddy checks <laughs> yeah. it. Who does like a full inspection of all their lights, whatever. Anyway, easiest probable cause in the world. And I, I'd gotten a talking to because I'm not writing enough tickets. All right, I'm going to write a bunch of fucking tag light tickets. It's the cheapest ticket. Here you go, man. Sorry. It's 50 bucks, 60 bucks. Pulled over this one guy one night, uh, Latino fella, no English. And he was trying to, you know, show him the ticket. You turn around on the back, you circle the phone number. Hey, call this number in 10 days. They'll tell you how much your fine is. And everybody's like, how much is it? That's the question everybody asked for the ticket. And we don't like keep up with it, but like we knew that like this is one of the cheapest tickets. It's, at the time, it was like 50, 60 bucks. And uh, I was explaining to this guy, you know, no English. And he pulls out a $50 bill. He's like, I pay now? And he wasn't trying, I don't think he was trying to bribe me, but he was literally just like, can I just pay now? Mm-hmm. And I kept saying, no, man, call this phone number. They'll tell you where to mail the check, blah, blah, blah. I pay now? I, I pay now? No, you don't pay now. After about the fifth time, sure, man, you can pay now. And I took the $50. I didn't need the $50. It was a fuck you to the department. You know, it's mm-hmm. like I'm trying to explain to this guy. I fresh off a suspension, very disgruntled. Sure, man. In, in, in the interest of putting this issue to bed and moving on with our days, yeah, you can pay now. And then I took his ticket of back so he wouldn't like. And uh, six months go by. And the story that was later told to me, this is how I got caught. Uh, that guy whoever he was, his brother got a ticket, a similar ticket one night. And his brother was complaining, like, hey, I got a fucking ticket. And then the guy I dealt with was like, oh, you could just, why didn't you just pay the officer? And his brother's like, that's not how that works. And he goes, well, that's how it worked for me. And he's like, what? And he's like, yeah, I got pulled over. I gave the officer 50 bucks. And then they, that, his brother complained to the police department and they tracked, they, they figured out the location and the time and my physical description and uh, they called me in. And you admitted it? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Just trying to do the right thing. You know, I was like, well. I mean, I, had, I also want to ask you this. Six months go by. This mm-hmm. thing at this point probably, it's, had you even remembered it or thought about I it I thought once? about it. You I did. thought it because I knew it was wrong. Yeah. I knew that I wasn't But were you thinking about it like, boy, six months down the line, this could bite me in the ass? I mean, what a weird way for some shit yeah. to come back and get you. Get this shit, okay? Unbeknownst to me, okay, once this guy filed the complaint and then they figured out, figured out it was me, they did an internal investigation. They had collaborated with the GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. They thought I was a serial offender. They thought I was just out there every night targeting Latinos with broken English oh, who may or may not even be here. They thought because apparently this had happened before when it was all said and done and I'm in handcuffs talking to the internal affairs, they they were just convinced. Wait, hold on. You can't just jump in handcuffs. <laughs> hold on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they brought you in. Did you yeah. get to go home that night or that day you're yeah. going? No, I, I got eventually I got to go home that night. So what happened? They're ta- what they ask you straight up, did you do this? And you say yes, yeah. I did. Well, okay. and my point too with the investigation, get this though. Uh they had undercover GBI officers tailing me uh during my whole shift. And for how long? And baiting me for a couple of weeks. Baiting you? I remember this happened one night. One night, this is a couple months after this had happened, uh, I'm going to call. Uh, I see this one car multiple times throughout the night. The same car. It was like a gray Pontiac Grand Am. And like I'm going to a call, and this car like does something. And I'm like, boy, this fucker's lucky I got to go to a 911 call, or I'd totally stop this asshole. Like, what's this guy doing? And then I saw him again a couple hours later. He threw trash out the window. 
And I, I was going to another call and I saw him for the third time in the same night doing something crazy. And I finally stopped him. I was like, dude, did you not see the police car? I was like, I've seen you twice tonight. You're lucky that blah, blah. And it was a Latino guy and he tried to bribe me. He did. And fortunately for me, in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, I know I did that once, but I ain't doing this shit again. Fortunately for me, I was like, no, that's not how this works, blah, blah, blah. I wrote him a real ticket and went on with his day. Later, when the investigation was concluded, they revealed that that was a GBI officer who was trying to bait me. It was. And he was on, he had camp body cams and they were trying to get me to do it again on camera. And like at the time, I was like, what, what an idiot. What is this guy doing? Yeah. And then I was like, oh, that's what that guy was doing. I was a GBI officer undercover trying to bait me, see if they could get me to do it again. So what point do you find out you're actually <sighs> under arrest and now going to prison, jail? What, where are we headed? I remember it so vividly. It was January 4th, 2005. I'm sitting, I'm uh, working day watch or what do we call it? So you're uh, still working I'm for still the police working. department. Okay. Yeah, I'm on. Uh, you're not on suspension or leave or any of that no, shit? No, because this. They, you know, because they want to catch. You. Yes, gotcha. Um, when that happened, I was working morning watch. I was working overnights. Now I'm working uh, afternoon watch. Is that what we call it? morning watch, afternoon, day watch. Anyway, I work two thirty to p.m. to ten thirty p.m. So it's about four p.m. January fourth, two thousand five. I'm sitting there in a parking lot of a strip mall eating Chinese food, just eating Chinese food in the car. And every officer has a, a radio number. For example, I was 3113, three meaning the third precinct, one meaning the first shift, and 13 meaning the beat I worked. So 31, anytime they said 3113, that was me. 3113, go ahead. Um, and we had uniform patrol officers. We had sergeants, lieutenants, and a commander. The commander was in charge of the whole precinct. He was the, the highest ranking officer at this precinct. Mm -hmm. Above him, you only had uh, deputy, chief, and chief. So this guy was a big wig. Uh, I forgot his name. But he the, the commanders and the lieutenants would never get on the radio. You never heard them on the radio. It was always sergeants talking to the officers, officers talking to the 911 dispatch. Uh, and his, his number was 3101. Whenever someone was an 01, that was a commander. That was, oh, shit. And we had a uh, regular channel on the radio that everybody could hear. If you had a police scanner, a civilian could sit there and listen to it. And then we had a private channel. And that's on, on regular channel, I might go 3113, switch to private. And then you switch to private. And now we have a private conversation. Our other officers can hear it, but civilians can't. Got police it. scanner people can't hear it. Uh, 3101 to 3113, go to Whoa, private. You got an 01 to a 13, go to private. You're having Chinese food in the park? Yeah. <laughs> oh. And of course, everybody else is like, oh, fuck. 3113's on private. 3113, I forgot what the code was. Uh, some code to meet back at precinct. I forgot whatever signal or code that was, but 3113, 10-4. A ten minute drive. And do you know what's up? I, I assumed it had something to do with you. That. Do yeah. I was like, okay. well, because I had a clear conscience. Other than that, mm -hmm. and like I said, even the suspensions, like I, I didn't feel guilty about right. wrecking a car. Right. I didn't feel guilty about breaking that guy's wrist. Right. Like I'm out here trying to fucking do my job and not get killed. Right. So the only guilty conscience I had, the only thing I knew, I was like, oh bucks. fuck, it must be that. And I walk into the precinct, and then the commander's office is commander. Lieutenant, two sergeants, and two detectives from Internal Affairs. Damn. And you know about Internal Affairs. They, that's a cop that investigates other mm -hmm. cops. So, And I was just like, fuck. And they're like, come in and close the door. I was like, how y'all doing? And like, go ahead and take your gun off. They immediately asked for my gun. Gave them my gun. And then they were like, I forgot how they, I mean, it was all just a blur. I forgot how they eased into the are conversation. Are you sitting down or are you standing? I'm standing, just shaking. And then they were like, you know, we got a complaint from so-and-so, so-and-so. And they're like, uh, was that you? I was like, yep. And they were like, all right, we'll go with these two detectives and the two internal affairs guys. Uh, I rode with them in their car. They didn't handcuff me then, but I went to internal affairs in like five hours of just that classic, you know, 48 hours. Because they're trying to find out if yeah. you're this serial offender exactly. and you're targeting Latinos who yep. don't speak English and, and they, may be here illegally. Yeah. And and they were convinced and they they were convinced that a i was doing that serially and b i was with no proof of it yeah with no proof of it 
Yeah, that's the only, that's I guarantee that's the only complaint I got because honestly, that's the only time I ever did it. But they thought I was doing it habitually and they thought I was working with other cops. And I remember one time they kept saying, just give us a name, give us a name and we'll, we'll take it easy on you. And I remember saying this vividly and <sighs> police world's weird in that like, do you not get to ask for an attorney right then and there and not answer their I, questions? Yeah, I could have, but I was just, I was like, I know where this is headed. I knew I was guilty. Mm -hmm. I was like, fuck it, whatever it's going to be. And in, in a part of me was relieved because I fucking hated the job. Mm -hmm. But um, police world is weird because let's say you're my partner. Even if we don't get along, I don't like you, you don't like me, at the end of the day, there's a, res a mutual respect and camaraderie because we're we have each other's lives in our hands, mm -hmm. right? And I had a couple of good friends there, but there was just a lot of guys I just didn't get along with because they were they were just stereotypical dickhead cops. That's one thing that I get so frustrated with police. Police are granted an incredible amount of discretion, meaning, you know, I, they've given me the power and the discretion to go to these calls and make a decision. And my point is, oh, there's a lot of cops out there, including ones I worked with. If legally I can arrest you, I'm going I'm to no if, ands, or buts. Right. Where I, not to pat myself on the back, but I try to use a little common sense and discretion. <clears throat> For example, you go to a, a domestic dispute, you know, and she says he did this and he says he didn't and there's kids and you learn the story that he's working and she's out of work. And now if she's sitting there with a black eye and a busted nose. Sorry, buddy, you, you're going to jail. But if it's, there's no, my point is arresting this guy tonight. Is that the best thing for this family? If he goes to jail and is out of work, I got three kids. Now, like I said, there's some crimes. Well, sorry, buddy, you're going to jail. But like the, the iffy stuff, Man, tonight's your lucky night. Don't maybe come back here. But my point is, there's so many cops I worked with. It's like, nope, 1015 was the code for arrest. 1015, mm -hmm. 1015, 1015. Regardless of any discretion. I don't know where it's going with that part. Oh, oh yeah. They said, uh, they, they were convinced that I was that I had partners. And I remember them saying, just give us a name. And I said, look, if there was a name I could give you, I would do it. Because I'm not loyal to any of these dickheads. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, if I if, yeah. if, if I could give you a name and and make my sentence lighter, I, of course I'd do it. But I'm telling you for the tenth time, it was a one time thing, and nobody else was involved. They were just so convinced that I was part of a ring of cops doing this, and uh, they they said they were going to make an example of me. Like, you've shamed the department, you've shamed your community. Uh, the district attorney was going to make a example out of you. This is there's no plea bargains available. This is going to trial. You will get convicted and you will go to prison for three to five years. Fuck. How do you feel hearing that? Are you, still, are you just fucking like, I need to sit down? I mean, that, that was, and this for six months from the time they told me that to the time it was all done, it was about six or seven months. For six or seven months, I was like, I'm going to prison in July. So wait, you're allowed to go home? Yeah, I well, I, I they let me go that night. I Not wasn't a halfway, under arrest. Ha okay. Yeah, they let me go that night. I wasn't even charged. They were like, "You're probably going to be charged mm -hmm. in a week or two. You are, as of this moment, fired. You're free to go. But once we get all our paperwork and ducks in a row, we will file we're charges. For yeah, you. and uh, sure enough, about two and, and in between, I did go get an attorney. And uh, about two weeks later, the attorney called and said, "All right, they've officially filed charges. You need to go turn yourself in." And so, that was a rough day. My yeah. mom and my girlfriend drove me down to, to Cobb, where to Cobb County Correctional Facility, and uh, I was in. I was in. You cry? No, nah, no. Nah, I was. I was. I felt like it, yeah. but I was there for about four or five hours. Where? Uh, in jail, not prison, but jail. Like a cell? Yeah, just a cell with, by yourself. No, with about ten other dudes. And I, even then, immediately, I was like, "Boy, I hope they don't find out I'm a cop." <laughs> just in jail. Now, prison's a whole nother story. But yeah, I was just in jail for like five hours. My girlfriend and mom bonded me out. I forgot what my bond was, but they went to a bail bondsman. You know that whole routine. Yeah, you pay 10%. Friends yeah. that are bail bondsmen. Yeah. yeah. So, so then you're out, and then you're out now until your court date? Yeah. Which, how much time was that for you? There was a couple of different uh, like arraignments. I, I think I went back to court two or three times over the next six or seven months. But the whole time... I'm you here. Can't work. No. You can't well, get a job. I, I immediately started a landscaping business. Okay. So, uh, 
actually the day I, I was unemployed for one day after that first day, I went home the next day. It's just, you know, telling my girlfriend, telling my parents, everything. And then the very next day I went down to the unemployment office and I was standing in line because, you know, I had rent. I had, you know, and I was standing in line. I was just like, oh, fuck this. You know, I'm not, I'm not. And I, uh, I got a job the next day driving a limo. I drove limos for like three months. <laughs> I remember when yeah. that was a job. Yeah. And we had uh, one of our clients was a, a hip hop label. So I drove around Little John. I drove Ludacris. I drove all these rappers. And uh, I just remember thinking like a week ago, I was a cop. Now I'm driving a limo and there's Ludacris in the back. So I did that for a few months uh, while I got my landscaping business off the ground. And, uh, you know, this was, like I said, I this happened in January. So, uh, you know, in Georgia, there's no landscaping to be done in the winter. But mm -hmm. so I slowly, I bought some equipment, took out a loan from my dad, bought bought a trailer and some equipment. And I had this nice little landscaping business going. And uh, funny, people who know this band will will appreciate this. But uh, the the guys I were working with, Stuck Mojo and Fozzy, the main guy, Jericho's the singer, but the founder of both those bands is a, a guitar guy named Rich Ward. And I was a huge fan all through high school, whatever. Um, so, and then, you know, this was before cop stuff. I was working for them, but I had kind of kept in touch with Rich and uh, just ran into him like at Blockbuster Video right after all this happened. And uh, he, he had been touring a lot, but he had taken a big break. And he's like, oh, you're doing landscaping? He's like, he's like, you need any help? I was like, what? He's like, do you need any part-time help? I was like, yeah, but Rich Ward, do you want to come edge sidewalks with me. Uh, but anyway, so Rich was my uh, assistant no for a few way. months. And my point is, uh, those six or seven months between the arrest and, and the trial, uh, like I said, every week, my attorney is like, prepare to go to prison for three years. And I was like, Okay. So you're out there on a ride. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I had already, uh, Rich had agreed to take, I wanted, I was going to keep Holy the business. Shit. I was going to turn the business over to Rich. Uh, and then uh, I was going to have him give, we cut a deal like, hey, you can take over this business, but uh, let's take 25% of revenue and give it to my fiance while I'm in prison for three years. And uh, so, yeah. And just, that was such a surreal spring because I'm just riding around, cutting lawns, and you know, thinking about going to prison. And oh, by the yeah, way, my not? my metal hero <laughs> yes. is my Ozzy Osbourne's yeah. over here, I mean, weed like, whack. To people who know, like he's <laughs> yeah, a, his, know. his picture was on Guitar Center. And, and, I mean, this guy's like a a guitar god. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, Rich, when you're done with the front, can you go weed eat the back? And he's like, sure thing, Dave. But Rich was going to take over my business and give some of the revenue to my fiance That's nice. for three years while I was in prison. That's nice. All yeah. right. So then, what happens? Uh, you're being you're preparing every day. Your anxiety's got to be through the roof. I'm going to prison, prison, prison. What must that be like? And if I thought and I'm, I'm a cop, and I'm a cop exactly. going to prison. If I thought I was going to white collar prison, that would have been you know troublesome of like, oh, what have I done to my life? Yeah. I'm going to prison, not as a cop, but as a dirty cop. Dirty cop. Oh, In fuck. gen pop. In gen pop. Fuck that, What's dude. up, white boy? <laughs> What's up, cop? Remember me, motherfucker? <laughs> nope. Theoretically could be in prison with people I put That's there. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, not yeah. in a different state. The same, right same state, same area. Going to prison for three years as a dirty cop. And I was like, well, I'm either going to get murdered or raped, or I'm going to have to murder somebody from not getting raped. Mm -hmm. So probably going to be a lot more than three years. <laughs> and it, it it was a horrible, horrible spring, just thinking about that every day. And again, nobody's fault but my own. Nobody's fault but my own. This isn't a woe is me. Nobody fucking made me take that. But I, I'm telling you sincerely, it was not a scam to, to, you know, abuse vulnerable immigrants. I was just like, it was a split second of poor judgment and rebellion. I was like, fuck y'all. Sure, I'll take your fucking 50 bucks. And yeah. So like I said, the whole time, that whole spring I was just like, and my attorney was like, there's no way around it, man. They're pissed. You just, oh, come on, man. I just thing. got a new snapper riding mower, Here's the other thing. Man. I was on come the news. On. I was all over the news. Oh, shit. So all your face is out there. In the area that I grew up in. Where you're cutting grass. 
people I went to high school with. Do people with. recognize you? Like, from they leaning out? Like, this guy's cutting my motherfucking grass right now. Uh, that I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I know a lot of people I grew up with were like, oh, shit, that's Dave Stone. Uh, for about two weeks. It was on the local news every night. Every night. What are they saying? What's the what's the portrayal on the news? Is dirty. it the whole dirty cops taking advantage of uh, immigrants? And yep. They're, they, oh, so they are putting that narrative publicly. Yes, and they set up a hotline. If you think you or someone you know was a victim of Officer Stone, call this number. How many people are calling Not that number? Not a goddamn one. I asked them that? after the fact. I said, how many fucking calls did y'all get? How many calls did you get? And they, they tell you? Mm-hmm. I was like, see, fucking told you. But yeah, they set up a hotline. Let's say hey, this is and a had huge you trailed problem. and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah, and by my point is, uh, by some miracle, like the the twenty third hour. What's the phrase? Is it the twenty third, twenty fifth hour? Right before, like a two a day or two before the trial, my attorney calls me. He's like, I I don't know what happened, but they're swamped. They got an overloaded caseload. They they want to do a plea bargain. If you plead guilty to this. Uh, you'll stay out of prison. You'll do five years of probation. And I was like, all right. And I pled guilty. And what if you didn't? Then it would have went to trial. And if I would have gotten convicted. Have to, would they have had to admit, though, that they had no calls on the hotline and all this yeah, stuff? Yeah, but I'm not being charged for that. Like, the thing I'm being charged with. Is the thing I you did actually do. did. Yeah. And I admitted to it, you know, off the record. That's in the their thing office. you said it. Yeah. And, you know, looking back, I'm like, you know, should I have not? But I was just like. Like karmically and cosmically, I was like, well, I've already done the bad deed. Let me at least try to just be honest from here on out and whatever I get, I deserve. All right. So you take the plea bargain. Mm -hmm. You're guilty. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for you in the state of Georgia? And as far as are you a convicted felon the rest of your life? Can you vote? Can you carry a firearm? What happened? At the time, I was a convicted felon. Even though I pled guilty, it's still a conviction. Mm -hmm. And uh Five years probation, uh, once a month, just had to go and, you know, meet with the probation officer. And do what? Piss test and all uh, that no, stuff? They or, didn't, they no, they didn't piss test me because it was, wasn't was drug or alcohol related. Got it. Uh, the main stipulation, like the biggest- Yeah, what's your test? My stipulation is I'm not allowed to work in law enforcement during the probation period. Okay. So every time, every month I'd go, really the only question he would ask me, well, he'd ask me, have I been arrested for anything petty or, or otherwise this month? And am I working as a law enforcement officer? And I was like, no. Just landscaping? Yeah, just landscaping. And I started doing comedy right after that. Okay. I, that's a whole other story. But I'd wanted to start comedy when I was 19 mm-hmm. and uh, just never had the nerve. I used to go to open mics. I'd write jokes, go to open mics, sign my name. Three or four times I went and they called my name and I just didn't have the nerve. I was just in the back of the room, silent. And then uh, after all that, I was like, fuck it. I'm, I'm doing I'm doing comedy. So. so you can't work law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Can you vote? No, couldn't vote, couldn't carry a, a firearm. But that's just for the probation period? Well, technically, yes, because an average felon in most states, it's for life. For life, yeah. But I got first offender status because okay. I had had a clean record up until then. I got some first offender status program where, uh, what's the term? Uh, after probation, it's supposed to be expunged, mm-hmm. like disappear from my record. And which has it, it? Which it did not because did. years later, I applied at a, to get an apartment and one of the questions was, have you ever been convicted of crime? And I put no. And then like, they were like, hey, we got a hit here that says you did. Why are you lying to us? I'm like, well, to be honest with you, I'm not lying purposefully, but I was told that it disappears from my record and I didn't have to admit that after the five years. And they're like, well, it showed up on our search. So how do you get that clear? Uh, I don't know. I'm still working on that. And, I'm, really? and I tried to buy uh, ammo at Walmart a few years ago. This was, you know, 18 years after the fact and something popped, something flagged and they wouldn't sell it to me. So I got to get all that straightened out through the state of Georgia. But yeah, it's supposed to ex- disappear from my record after probation. But And I don't give a shit about any of that, really. I, mean, I hear you, but you- But I am allowed to vote for some reason. I have been okay. voting, but the firearms thing- They're looking at that and being like, bro, that Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about, um, okay, so here's the thing that sucks for you, I think, is that you you take the plea bargain, right? Well, mm-hmm. I, I understand why, yeah. but you have to admit guilt. Mm-hmm. So then all that bullshit on the news, that narrative is looks true. Mm-hmm. Because this dirty cop just said he did do it. Because it was true. Yeah, I did do that. But yeah. not what they were saying yeah. about this whole ring of police, exactly. or you were like the leader of this group that was fucking yeah. taking advantage. Damn, dude. Yeah. Facing three to five as a cop in the same spot where you fucking put people. Fuck that. Yeah, man. Big time. 
Big time fuck that. Um, all right, I want to uh, shift gears because mm-hmm. I want to talk about this other story <laughs> real fast about uh, some trouble you have with a fire, I guess. <sighs> God damn. All right, long story short, my dad passed away in uh, June of 18, and uh, real unexpectedly. And, of course, that sucked. Um, and I just started dating my now wife. We were on again, off again a lot before that, but I just kind of, we just kind of cleaned everything up and started really settling down together. And my dad passes away and uh, had to cancel dates. I was in Cincinnati about to go bananas and I got the phone call. I had to cancel that. And uh, anyway, uh, her dad owned a, a nice little cabin up in Lake Arrowhead, California. And my girlfriend at the time, she was like, listen, just go up there for like a week you know, just mourn, grieve, you know, do whatever you got to do. It's, you know, right there on the lake. It's beautiful. And uh, she she had to stay back in L.A. and do some work. But I was up there for about five or six days by myself. And it coincided with my birthday. The, la- the second to last day I was up there was my birthday. So she shows up with a barbecue smoker, a nice uh, Brinkman trash can smoker. I- I'm a big barbecue guy. And uh, – so I was like, oh, cool. And I remember I invited Billy Wayne Davis, a uh, good buddy. He came up and hang out and we had some birthday pulled pork. I smoked a pork roast and uh, I'd done this hundreds of times. And the way I usually do it is, you know, you smoke whatever you're smoking. And then uh, especially if you're if your thing's sitting on concrete or something non-flammable, I just leave the coals in the smoker. And over time, over a few hours, they, they burn themselves out. No harm, no foul. Rather than you know, eventually you got to scoop that shit out and dispose of it because you get too much of it. But as was a new smoker, you know, there was no old ashes in there. So I spent like 14 hours smoking this pork roast, uh, pork shoulder. And, you know, we ate it and had a good time. And then late that night, I was like, oh, I'm just going to leave, leave the thing there. And we left the next morning. And uh, so and the irony is, uh, I remember it was a Sunday morning. We spent like two hours. I was up there for like a week. So, you know, I it had been well used. But we spent about two hours cleaning the cabin. Leave it like you found it. You know, dad was nice enough to let me use it. Yeah. yeah. You know, clean the kitchen, clean the porch, blah, blah, blah. And I left the smoker on the back porch and I left the uh, coals in it, the ashes in it. And I had I had done the math. Like I had stopped smoking it at about 8 o'clock p.m. the night before. And we left at noon the next day. So this is – we're going on 16 hours that these coals – have been sitting in this smoker. And I even touched the coals and stuck my hand in there and stuff to me. And it was cool to the touch. 16 hours they've been sitting there. We drive the two hours back to LA. We're literally pulling into our apartment and she gets a phone call from the neighbor. And she's like, what? It's on fire. I fucking, by the time we had left two hours later, it had disappeared. It was on the news. There's a ba- lot. You're back on the news again? Back on the news. Like, they didn't. <laughs> I yeah, wasn't on the news. Yeah, could you imagine? But it was on some. They're like, this dirty cop burned this out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Burned it to the ground. Are you sure it's the coals, though? A- a- great question, Ryan. I don't think it was the coals, but the Riverside County fire investigator said, oh, he's a smoker. Smoker must have done it. Must have. This is August. I want to go home. This is August in the mountains of California. Are we sure it's not a coincidental electric fire? Are we sure somebody didn't do something? Exactly. But uh, Cool to the touch and be able to put your hand in there. There's nothing that should be able to pop out of that. Yep. And uh, her dad could not have been cooler. Yeah. Really? Ah. He's like, I hated this fucking Ah. place. For insurance. Ah. And I was like, do you understand what I'm telling you? Like- this is about the worst phone call he could get other than like, hey, your daughter fell off a boat. Yeah, what? and he's chill with it? Couldn't have been cooler. Insurance, rebuilt, bigger, flipped it, sold it. Boom. I, th- I think I inadvertently did him a favor. <laughs> I was about to say, you made like, him some money. Something was up. Yeah. He has since passed. <laughs> but something was up because he was too chill. Yeah, like, man, we got to yeah. I and wonder the, if he didn't do and it. And at the, the end of the conversation, he goes, well, I got one question. I was like, what's that, sir? How was the barbecue? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty good, sir. I don't know if it's worth all the trouble. But, uh, yeah, that was a good time. Damn, dude. Yeah. 
Uh, well, that's a great way to end the episode right there, brother. Um, yeah. Thank you for coming on. Yeah. Uh, before we end this officially, uh, it's your first time here. I'm going to ask you now advice you would give to your 16-year-old self. Don't after. become a cop. <laughs> <laughs> and watch your carbs. <laughs> That's great Find advice. another line of work, dickhead. That's great advice. <laughs> um, plug and promote everything again, please. Uh, pack a lunch uh, now on YouTube. Uh, it's my first actual proper special uh, audio version you can find digitally. Uh, there might still be some vinyl left at blondemedicine.com. And uh, Boogie Monster every – when do we release that? Tuesday, every Tuesday with me and Kyle Kinane. Stoneberg's every Wednesday with me and my wife, Katie Strandberg Stone. So, yeah. All right. Come see me on tour, dumbdavestone.com. Thank you. And uh, guys out there, support the special. Go watch it. Come see me on tour. Tickets are available at ryansickler.com. Thank you as always. We'll talk to you all next week. Mm -hmm.